In this video, I'd like to introduce you to the WebSocket protocol. But first, I'm going to show you something about the tutorials and the tutorial solutions because I'm going to actually talk through with the tutorial solution as I do this video. So let's just jump across to where I've put the tutorial up onto GitHub. And you'll see down here, uh, so this is the tutorial on WebSocket, and down here there is a drop down list for which branch you're looking at. And the master branch contains the code at the beginning of the tutorial. Uh, but I've also put in a solution branch. Uh, and if you flick to the solution branch, uh, this is then showing you the code with the changes that I've made to put the solution to the tutorial in there. The next thing that it might be quite useful for you to do is to have a look over here and see where it says compare. So if you click that compare button, you can actually have a look at specifically what changes do I, did I make uh, to each line of the code in order to go from the, uh, from the master branch, from the state at the start of the tutorial, to what's in the solution. And as you can see, there's, there's a bit of code in this one, but not terribly much. Um, for this week's tutorial, uh, I've first of all done a solution that uses WebSockets, and that's in the solution branch. The next thing that I did after that was I did a solution using server sent events, which we'll look at in the next video, and that is in the event source branch. Server sent events, uh, also sometimes called event source. So if I flick across to the event source branch and click compare, uh, I can then, for instance, compare the solution branch to the event source branch, and we can see what changes I made, including to the README, it turns out, uh, what changes I made to the code in order uh, to add the uh, server sent events solution, uh, which in this case, it, it's not actually terribly much code. If you look down the, the page, it looks long because there's a whole bunch of changes that I made to the README uh, to explain uh, what I've done in terms of the event source solution. Okay, so now let's skip to the, uh, the material that we wanted to talk about today, to introducing WebSockets. So far, in the course, we've looked at fairly typical HTTP requests. And in this request model, the browser makes a request down to the server, and the server sends a response. And the browser makes another request, and the server sends up a response. And whether we're doing it kind of traditionally, where each response is a new page that gets shown in the browser, or we're using XML HTTP request, uh, making requests in the background, in this model, the server is always sending responses in response to a request from the browser. But suppose we wanted some kind of system in which there were multiple different browsers, perhaps multiple different users connected to our service, and a request, some change that gets made by user A on browser A down to the server, means that, well, we really ought to tell user B, who's got the page open in browser B, about this. And we ought to send a message out to browser B. Well, that HTTP model isn't quite ideal for that, because in this case, we want this message to be sent up to browser B, even though browser B hasn't taken any action to receive it, hasn't made a request. We want, uh, from the relationship between browser B and the server, this is a, a message being sent from the server to the browser, somewhat unprompted, prompted instead by what happened in a different session. So how can we do this? Uh, this is what WebSockets is, um, is going to help us with. Uh, the idea of WebSockets is that we open a connection to the server, a WebSocket connection, and we keep that WebSocket open. And all the time that that WebSocket is open, the browser can send messages to the server, or the server can send messages to the browser. They can each do it at any time, doesn't need to be in response to a particular request. And so we have an actual bi-directional channel, uh, channel for message passing. So as an overview of WebSockets, the, the protocol itself is designed to work over the same ports that HTTP works over. So port 80 for HTTP and port 443 for HTTPS. And so WebSockets unencrypted go over port 80, WS, 
and WSS, an encrypted web socket, goes over the same port as HTTPS. This is partly because web proxies and firewalls and things like this tend to let those ports through because it thinks of them as, well, those are web connections. And well, this is a web connection, it's, but it's a new kind of web connection. To make this work, the handshake looks very much like an HTTP request. It looks like an HTTP GET request with some particular um, headers set in it. And the connection after the handshake, after the initial uh, request from the uh, from the browser and the initial response header from the server, the connection then upgrades to a WebSocket protocol, which is a binary protocol. And we're not going to delve into the binary part of the protocol, but we are going to look at the HTTP-like headers. Now, this connection can be long-lived, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we've always got a message to send over it. So suppose you're on this page for an hour and not many messages have gone past in the last half an hour. If you can imagine, one of the systems at one end of the connection might kind of think, well, is the, pers is the, is the system at the other end still there? Has it, um, has it hung? Has it left the connection open but, um, but actually has crashed or forgotten about what it's doing? Is the connection just kind of a leaked resource? Uh, so there's a heartbeat built into the protocol. It's built into the um, the binary part of the protocol where if at any time after the connection's made, the client or the server can send a ping and the other end must reply with a pong as soon as possible to, search, to show that they're still listening. And so there's particular codes that get sent over, over the TCP connection uh, to represent that ping and the pong. So I said that the handshake looks like an HTTP request to start with. And so here it is. The uh, This is a particular example. This is an example taken from the RFC, from the uh, the specification of, um, of the WebSocket protocol. And so here we've got the initial request line. It's a get request, slash chat, HTTP 1.1, host serverexample.com. So far looks like an ordinary get request. And then we start to hit a few unique headers. So particularly, we see this upgrade header saying, please upgrade this to WebSocket. And we see a connection header saying, upgrade the connection, please. And we also see this key. This key is something that's generated by the client, and it's going to be used by the server to prove that this connection was received and understood and that the server supports WebSockets. And it's partly this is partly done to ensure that, um, that you can't trick a WebSocket connection to responding to a, um, a, a carefully crafted form or XML HTTP request. The protocol down here, the, these headers are also typical for um, uh, typical for a WebSocket connection. Uh, usually SEC WebSocket protocol, that's the, the sub-protocol that it uses, and usually that's just chat. So the server then sends a response, and again, it looks like an HTTP response. Here is the status line coming back from the server, uh, but you possibly haven't seen this code before, 101. And 101 is usually called switching protocols, uh, but you might see a different uh, name for the uh, name for it coming afterwards. Uh, 101 is the important part there. Um, so this is the server saying, "All right, let's let's switch protocols, and we'll become a WebSocket connection." And here we have the upgrade header, upgrade WebSocket connection, upgrade, and the uh, the protocol, and then it picks one that it can support from the ones that the client suggested. Um, but we've also got this quite unusual header here. Now, this one, uh, this proves that the server received the request and it proved that the server supports WebSockets. Uh, the place it comes from is you take the key that was sent by the client in the sec WebSocket key header. So um, this here, that particular string, which is a base64 encoded uh, number, and you append to it this long, unique string. It's, it's, a, it's a UUID, uh, which is a number which is astronomically unlikely to be allocated by anyone else. And this is a specific UUID 
that means WebSockets. And so the idea is that a server that doesn't support WebSockets is astronomically unlikely to have that particular UUID to concatenate onto the end. So if it's got that number, this thing must have been written with WebSockets in mind. And so it appends that to the key sent by the, the client and it then takes the SHA1 hash of the result. It basically puts it through a mathematical function to produce a number that's much, much shorter than the string that it's created, uh, but where any differences in the string would produce a very different number. And so this number can be checked to see, yep, yep, that number was correct. I believe that you did indeed concatenate the two things together and take the, SSH, uh, the SHA1 hash of them. Um, that number comes back again, uh, this, uh, this encoding, this is a particular encoding, uh, base64, uh, for describing a big number in a shortish number of uh, numbers and letters. So after the handshake, the protocol becomes the WebSocket binary protocol, and we're not going to delve into the details of that. You could get some kind of a network analysis tool, something like Wireshark, that would let you listen to what's being sent over the connection to have a look at it, but we're not going to. All right, let's at this point jump across to a little bit of a demo. So what I'm going to do, I've at the moment got open. Um, this is it running the code. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm in the same directory here and I'm going to switch from the master branch to the solution branch. Git checkout solution and Git will change all of the files on my uh, my working copy, what, what's checked out into my file system to make that the uh, to make that the the, the the solution rather than uh, the starting state of the project. And so if I now jump across to here, oh, it suddenly spots that the the files have changed and we're now looking at the solution. And so we can see the listener and the gibberish hub and things that in the tutorial I say to add to your code. Now, because I have now just changed all this code, I am going to stop the server. And I'm going to go reload just in case there were any changes in build.sbt that SBT would need to have a look at. In this case, I know there weren't, but for some of the tutorials, you should, you should do the reload. And then I'm going to set it running again. And now I'm going to go back to my browser and I'm going to open this page that had been looking at a page from um, the start state of the project. So I'm going to hit refresh and now it's got all of the code of the solution in it. And the pause is because I've just changed all of those files on the filing system. And so now SBT needs to recompile my code. Uh, and there it's now done it. And so we can now see that we've got still the, the get gibberish thing happening. Um, but we've also got a WebSocket connection going on that I'll show you in just a moment. And every time I click get, get gibberish and something involving Algernon ends up in there, I'll get a message over the WebSocket and it will turn up uh, in this section down here. But so if we have a look here, there is the request for the WebSocket. And let's... Um, Let's copy the request headers and maybe let's open up. Uh, let's just open up uh, something that has a big, a nice big text field that I can paste those headers into to show show them to you. And uh, so here is the request that my browser made when I was um, making that WebSocket connection. And so here we see the get. And we've got the get on the on the path, and here we have ws colon the actual protocol uh, in there, and the path that that it made the request on. We can see lots of ordinary um, HTTP like headers in there, but there is our connection upgrade. There is our upgrade WebSocket. Um, there's that sec WebSocket version 13. Here is the key that Chrome has generated when uh, making the WebSocket connection and um, that all looks fairly normal. And now let's pop back across and let's see if we can get the response headers. And let's go and paste those in instead. 
And here's the response headers, and we can see that we've got the 101 switching protocols, upgrade WebSocket, connection upgrade, and that is the uh, the response that was generated from conc concatenating the key with a funny string and doing the processing on it. Um, in terms of what's being sent over it, fortunately Chrome's developer tools has something in there to help me have a look at the messages being sent over the WebSocket. So although I can't delve into the binary part of the um, of the WebSocket for debugging um, my code, this thing should have sent me a message. Where is it? Uh, well, I can actually have a look and see the see the data coming in over the WebSocket just here. All right. So let's now have a look at WebSocket in play. How do we write the server end of our WebSocket? And here's where I need to tell you a little bit about actors, because there's going to be some code that you're going to need to see. And um, this code might have some stuff in it that you're, well, perhaps not entirely used to seeing. So here we have a gibberish WebSocket actor extending untyped actor. And we've got this funny stuff about props here and actor refs, etc. What's this all about? Well, when play does WebSocket, it does it using a framework called Acker. Acker is a framework that supports actors. And these are a very simple model of concurrent programming. And you can pretty much imagine an actor as being like a person who has an inbox that can accept messages. And at any time, you can send the actor a message and stick something in their inbox. And the actor, what they keep doing is when they get a message, they do something depending on what was in the message. So actors are very much defined by this on receive method. And that's where you put in most of the code that says what you want them to do. The thing that's going to make it a little bit more complicated for Akka uh, and for play is that generally speaking you don't have an ordinary Java reference to another actor and the reason being that well this model of concurrency the actor you're talking about could actually be on a different machine not necessarily running in the in the same Java process and Akka tries to make that as easy to work with as working with a local actor um, and so because of this Usually, the kind of reference you have isn't an actor, it's an actor ref. Uh, and only the actor framework, only act actor itself, actually has the reference to the actor to call on receive or to call a constructor. And instead, we're kind of doing stuff through the actor framework. And so we say actor ref dot tell, and actor works out how to get the message through. Um, one of the complications this means is that uh, you don't call the constructor on your actor yourself. Instead, in play, there is when you define your act, your actor, you tend to define a public static method that's going to return an object called props. And props is going to contain the information that Acker needs to call your constructor. So it needs to know what class of actor am I creating? So you call it with your actor dot class and any constructor parameters you want passed to it. And so here's my constructor, public gibberish websocket actor, string topic, actor ref out. And so, well, my constructor takes a string called topic and an actor reference called out. So my props has the class followed by the topic and out. OK, let's pop back to the slides. For a WebSocket in play, there's two actors involved. There's one actor that is all about sending messages up to the client, writing stuff out to the TCP socket that is going to be interpreted by the browser and as a message. Play will create that actor for you because play knows how to write out to the TCP socket. There's another actor which is about well, receiving messages from the client. And this is the one that you write because, well, you need to tell it what to do on receive. What do you want it to do when it gets a message from the browser? In the tutorial, 
we won't actually be sending messages from the browser, but we'll still be creating this actor because we need it for the WebSocket. We need an actor at each end. And we'll use the server-side actor to, um, well, basically to call tell on the client-side actor. So what we end up doing is we write our own little method uh, well, we write our own little listener that's going to hook in and listen for whenever we generate some gibberish. And uh, we'll register that listener on the gibberish hub. And whenever we get a message from the gibberish hub, we're going to convert that into a, a JSON string. And we're going to send it out to the client actor. So we're going to call out.tell. So that actor that's responsible for sending things over the TCP channel up to the browser write out this message and by the way it came from me the server side actor uh, self is a is a way of getting an actor ref for this actor okay so have a look at the tutorial code to see a, a commented example there is quite a bit of code there but i've tried to explain it step by step and typically speaking you will probably find that if you're wanting to create actors you're better off taking that code and modifying it to do what you need rather than trying to write it from scratch uh, just because it's there's a lot of it that ends up effectively being boilerplate because it's just specific particular set things you end up having to do like like the props method okay so in play the handshake we said uh, for a WebSocket looks like an ordinary HTTP GET request. And so, well, how do we handle GET requests in play? We have a root, an entry in the roots file that maps that particular request to a controller method. So we're still going to need to create a root and a controller method. And I say again, see the tutorial code. Let me go and show you that in the tutorial code. Uh, so let's open the project window and JSON example was our controller that we used for sending out the JSON. And down here, I've created our controller method. And the controller method ends up calling um, return WebSocket dot string with actor of out to gibberish, etc., etc. Et and it's a slightly unusual invocation, partly because we're calling a generic method so that um, uh, WebSocket angle bracket string with actor. You might not have seen that format of Java call before. Uh, you might also not be so used to this construct, which is a Java 8 lambda. Um, so we're basically WebSocket dot with actor takes a callback containing the actor ref for the client, and we take that actor ref for the client, and we um, we call our props method with topic dot out, and that's going to give us our props object to say what kind of actor to construct, and that's what we return into uh, WebSocket dot with actor, and it then does the rest, and we just have to return the WebSocket it created. So it's a little bit of an unusual invocation, but hopefully, kind of as you have a look at it, and as you have a look at the gibberish WebSocket actor dot code, hopefully you'll be able to see. Uh, what it's doing. It's a kind of a little bit of knitting into the play um, API that it's provided for us. And in the roots file, uh, there we have the get on WebSocket because it starts out looking like a get request, uh, passing it through to our WebSocket controller method. What about the browser side? Well, the browser side of the code, thankfully, is actually incredibly simple. So to create a WebSocket, we say var example socket is new WebSocket, and we give it the URL that we want it to connect to. And you'll see because this is WebSocket protocol, it's WS colon at the beginning. And very often, I believe the browsers do tend to want you to give the, um, the, the, the full URL a little bit like that. So in the tutorial code, the uh, code I've suggested, it's up here, and I did it in a CoffeeScript version in xhrexample.coffee. And I've said window.getsocket is a method that, well, it creates a WebSocket, and I've passed it window.location.host, which is the, um, the origin, if you like, and the path WebSocket. And I've given it this query at the end, topic is Algernon. Well, if our, if our WebSocket request starts out as a GET request, then it's valid for me to put, put, to put a query on the end. 
Once that's opened the WebSocket, I then just need to say what do I want to do whenever I get a message. So I go WebSocket.onMessage is function taking a message and um, the the field you're going to be most interested in is message.data that contains the data that we, uh, that was sent in the in the message and in this case I'm sending string messages and I'm pass, parsing them into JSON and I'm then going window.receive.push of JSON that goes and sticks the message that I've just received into an array and I'm then calling re-render. Re-render is a function that um, I put it into the react.js tutorial. Uh, maybe I didn't bring enough attention to it. So in gibberish.jsx, uh, at the bottom of my JSX file, I declared this method, this function re-render as being the thing to say, render my app into this node, uh, into the node with the, ID, with the ID render me. And I then immediately called it. But so this means that if I want to re-render to update the React stuff that's on the page, I just call re-render and it does it. And React does its thing working out what the what the diffs it need what diffs it needs to make to the document object model. So that is this call. I've received the data, I've put it into my array, and now I'm calling re-render to, to re-render the data. And the other change that I've done is I've modified um, I've modified the render method for my gibberish app. So this renders a gibberish app and I've modified the render method to put in at the end this uh, h2 a heading and over the WebSocket followed by a gibberish list that is driven off that window.received array that I pushed the data into. And so that's the um, the journey it takes. It comes as a message, it goes into this, it gets parsed, it gets pushed into this array, and then I call re-render, and uh, uh, React re-renders my gibberish app, which includes now this component, including the, the list of what was in that array. And generally speaking, that seems to work pretty well. And so we can see the events going past here. And every time there's a couple of Algernons up here, it is putting the Algernons down here. It's receiving them. So here we go. The example socket on message is function. That's the JavaScript uh, version of it. And you're mostly likely to want to see what's in uh, event.data. In this case, I called the argument event there. Some other useful methods that you might need, example socket.close closes the connection and if you want to send some data from the browser down to the server over this connection, example socket.send of data. And that data that you do via example socket.send would turn up in the on receive method. And so that would trigger something happening here. As it happens in the tutorial example, I don't have the client sending anything down the WebSocket. I've only got it writing stuff up the WebSocket. So this code in here is just kind of dummy. Oh, if I get a message, send something back saying I received your message. Um, but so at the moment that on receive is not likely to be invoked because I'm not sending any messages from the client over the WebSocket. A couple of notes that might be helpful. Uh, one of the things is if you're on an HTTPS page, if you've opened a page over an encrypted connection, a lot of the browsers won't let you open an unencrypted uh, connection from that. Uh, and instead, you'd need to open a WSS one and you'd need to have um, you know, your SSL, etc. set up on, on the server. Um, the reason that might be uh, worth noting is because in the tutorial, in the readme, so let's go and open the readme. Let's get it from here. Uh, so tutorial WebSocket, and let's look at the no, the, the master branch is fine. The instructions on there, and part way down here, I suggest using this echo page. So let's copy that link, and let's paste that in, and we'll make the page a little bit bigger. And so I could put in. Uh, what was it? It was localhost 9000 because I'm on port 9000. 
WebSocket uh, topic equals Algernon. And in this case, I can connect because I'm over the HTTP version. If I were to accidentally go to the HTTPS version and try doing exactly the same thing, WS localhost 9000 WebSocket topic equals Algernon and say connect, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Um, but if I were to open the developer tools and have a look on the console, I would see a uncaught security error, fail to construct WebSocket and insecure WebSocket connection may not be initiated from a page lo loaded over HTTPS. So I've put that note in case you get find yourself loading this on HTTPS and getting silent failures. Uh, if instead we load it over HTTP and uh, let's redo the connection there and just show some data coming up over this WebSocket. Let's connect. We're connected. And now if I go back over here and start to get gibberish, we should have had a couple of messages. And over here, yep, there they are. There's those messages have come over the WebSocket uh, that I did from this echo test page. So I'm going to stop the recording there. I'd encourage you to work through the tutorial. Um, generally, I've put the um, the solutions up not just for this tutorial, but for all of the tutorials. So each of the tutorials on GitHub has a master branch and a solution branch, and you can uh, compare between them. And in this case, and we'll see this in the next video, there is also an event source branch to show, well, let's use server sent events instead of WebSockets for this one.